Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Simon Eisenbach. For those of you who do not know me, I am a commercial and humanitarian slash documentary photographer and filmmaker. Currently, I'm based out of South Utica, but I'm traveling all over the globe. Um, just to start off giving you guys a little bit of an idea of what I do, here you go. All right, so that gives you guys a little bit of a glimpse. Um, basically, kind of the way my talk's gonna go today is it's gonna be a mix of me telling stories of how I got here along with questions from you guys. I love answering questions, um, and I, being a storyteller, my favorite way is to tell stories. So, how did I get here? Well, I started actually right here at MV. Uh, 12 years ago, I was a student here, and I was on the bowling team. At that time, we were actually number 13 in the nation of two and four year schools. At this point in time, I had not touched a camera. Um, I kind of fell into photography a couple of years later, um, but first I fell into traveling. Uh, from 2002 or three until 2010, my dad built a hospital in Mali, West Africa. And I started tagging along on those trips with him. And this is a little bit of that, um, this one in the center, that is actually the second largest mosque in the world in Casablanca, Morocco. And I was actually standing across a bay from it, and it is still that tall. Um, this on the top left is me sitting on a crocodile in Burkina Faso, West Africa, which is basically my second home, as I like to call it. And then in the bottom left is us uh, me and some friends playing a concert in Burkina Faso, West Africa. Um, I grew up playing drums, so it just kind of happened. Uh, just different things that happened on the trips. The main purpose of those trips initially was I was actually doing construction work with my dad. Uh, my dad's a civil engineer, and so that's how he got into the hospital deal. Um, and then later on, this right here in the middle was my dad and I building a rock climbing wall in Indonesia, which was my first trip overseas after I had picked up a camera. This was where things kind of started to make a turn. And then at that time, I was actually working for my dad's engineering firm. I was doing asbestos related work, that kind of stuff. Nothing glamorous. And I decided one day that I was gonna just quit and I didn't want to do it anymore. So I moved to Taiwan. Um, I was living in Taipei, which is a major city. Think of it as like a mini New York. I realized very quickly that I hated living in a major city. Um, I, I realized I like space and having a car and being able to drive. Um, that being said, this was where I actually started to learn video. Uh, I hadn't touched video at all. I just happened to have a camera that shot video and I decided to start playing with it. And that was in 2012. Um, this, was take, this photo was taken on vacation on the right. And then that, started to open doors, but I realized that trying to live there wasn't gonna be a very 
sustainable thing if I wanted to do what I wanted with media. And I didn't even really want to work for myself, quite frankly, still to this day, I don't want to work for myself. Uh, I like the having the like comfort of having a steady paycheck, um, which is funny because I couldn't see myself living any other way, but I still to this day do miss having that steady paycheck. Um, but I came home right literally three days before Hurricane Sandy hit and got stuck in New York City. And by the time I got home, I got a call from one of my college roommates, which in a way turned into what would become my future. So I was doing disaster cleanup in New Jersey from Hurricane Sandy when this is pretty much the look I had. We were working 14 hours a day and my dad calls me and says, hey, I'm going to Burkina Faso in January. Your mom won't let me fly by myself. Do you want to go all expenses paid? I had nothing else going on. And so of course I'm going to go. Why wouldn't I? I already love traveling. Um, and on that trip, that trip was a little bit of a strange one where, again, kind of one of the things I want to get the point across is things happen for reasons I don't know and have led me to this, to where I am today. Um, and so it's just kind of rolling with the way things go in, in time and space. Um, on that trip in Burkina, we ended up getting kind of a tour of what was going on. And I took this photo, which to this day is one of my favorite photos of all time. As you can see, that young girl is riding through the center of a bike frame. Um, and that photo, along with some of the other things that we saw on that trip, were eye openers for me that the NGO that we were working with did not have the ability to do really what they were wanting to do and trying to do because they didn't have funding. They were having trouble getting funding because they didn't have the visual content to stand out against what American audiences were used to seeing because in this day and age, you're getting bombarded with so many photos and videos that it's, it was, and this was in 2013, so you're already getting bombarded with the visual so they couldn't compete. So I kind of realized that what I wanted to do in some capacity was help these NGOs get better content so that they could compete and do what they do. Uh, that being said, these trips are not all glamorous. This is us fixing our trailer after we broke all of the springs on the trailer getting out into the bush village. At the same time, I had food poisoning. And you could imagine how that is in about, a, it was about 100 to 110 on that trip. Um, it wasn't too hot. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so after we got home from that trip, I kind of realized that that was really where I wanted to go with things. And my dad was like, well, if you're going to do it, start a company and do it legally and do it the right way from the start. And so I said, OK. Figured out, talked to my dad's lawyer, figured out what I had to do the whole nine yards. And then we uh, jumped back on a plane back over to Burkina. I was over there for about a month and a half worth of a three month period. And I, that trip, I was actually following a crew drilling wells. Um, this would be really where I started to develop what I was passionate about in charge of, in way of topics. Uh, I do a lot of stuff involving clean water, as you'll kind of see throughout, uh, especially in Burkina Faso, which is a very dry landlocked country. Um, but it's also very hot there. Uh, this trip, it was averaging about 120 to 130 in the afternoon. And we were working through the day. And the Burkina Bay people were laughing at us because of the fact that we didn't take our siesta and hide in the shade in the heat of the afternoon. Um, to give you guys an idea of how hot that is, I melted a hole through the side of a 9-volt battery, which was sitting in my bag. Never actually used that battery. Um, that is just a little bit of warmth. And so it takes a lot to make sure that I have my redundancies in place for when these types of things happen. Uh, moving forward in time, I was doing work here, little commercial stuff here and there. Nothing crazy, but still just churning to get back overseas. 2014, I went back to Burkina Faso and started doing some more clean water work. But this time, it was around irrigation. Uh, 
a group of people paid for, and I was following the installation of a solar powered irrigation system. Um, you can kind of see it right here. There's spigots throughout, and then the trench goes over here, and there's more spigots. And this was a solar system because they were trying to see if solar was a sustainable model for providing irrigation into rural communities that were having to struggle to get water. Most of them were using hand dug wells, which dried up during the dry season. Um, the problem with solar is it's insanely expensive. It's over $20,000 still to this day. So it's a project that we literally captured all this content for that I never really did anything with because it's just so astronomically expensive to try and pull off at scale. Um, and that is because there, to be able to get all of the communities just would take millions of dollars. Uh, that being said, this community was able to change lives around the school that we put this in at. Uh, this photo will forever be one that I've re I remember this moment because these women were in their late teens and I had taught them how to use a faucet. Can anyone in this room re remember the exact moment they learned how to use a faucet? And the joy on these women's faces when I first showed them how to use a faucet, it was like something that, the, it's, it's like your first bite of chocolate when you're a kid, like you don't understand, it's just magical. Um, and so these women realized that their lives were now changed because they had access to water without having to work. And they were able to provide by growing more crops. And we'll get back to this in a little bit, but in a year, the garden had grown, grown sixfold. And the school went from barely being able to sustain feeding their students to selling surplus at the local market. They were then turning that money that was profit into more work that they were doing growing crops and then helping the school expand. Uh, so things like that have just changed lives. And it's not, for me, I look at fit topics that are relating to creating more sustainable living. Um, there's a lot of different avenues about it, uh, but that's just one of the big ones for me. Uh, this, yeah, Burkina is like, I think I've been there six or seven times. Lots of, lots of fun. Um, it's also been interesting where I've had the cops called on me numerous times. Um, this was in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and I was running a bunch of time lapses. And the people I was working with had left for a few minutes. And apparently every person driving called the cops and saying that there's a weird white guy with cameras. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, my buddy was able to get, <coughs> answer the phone, and we were able to explain to the cops what we were doing. Um, I think they still didn't know, but my buddy spoke Thai, so he was able to get me through. Uh, and so it's just more and more opportunities continued to come. But at the same time, I was growing a business here in the States, uh, and actually all locally, where I was working with more and more businesses. So it had become this like delicate balance of doing business here versus doing what I'm really passionate about. And 2016 became all about business in the US, which actually t was kind of like rough for me because I just, for me, I'm literally, if I could live overseas, I would be happy as a clam. It's just not sustainable for what I do because it's hard with getting all of the supplies that I need to a place. Um, and a perfect example is where I was in 2017, uh, in early 2017. In February and March of 2017, I was in Nebobongo in DR Congo. Um, to give you guys an idea, we had to fly from New York to Qatar, Qatar to Uganda, and then take a private six-seat plane into the Congo. Um, we were so far remote that during the Civil War, there was no fighting at the hospital we were at because it was too far out for them to bother going to. Um, and yeah, so this hospital is the only hospital for 275,000 people. And so the org that I was working with, which is named E4 Project, they are working with this hospital to create it to as close to US standards as they can get, even though it will never actually be fully US standards. Um, but the work that they're doing is incredible. And then 
the org is also doing a lot of stuff around the hospital to create sustainability. So they're starting social enterprise, doing clean water work, and other various efforts like that. Um, and it's, it's funny because I had met someone that used to work for the org, and he had left, and again, random chance, you never know what's gonna happen. I, after I graduated from MV, I went to Nyack College, which is a small Christian private school downstate. I happened to walk onto the soccer team as a goalie, and after my two years, I kept going back for the alumni game. Well, I met the previous development director for this org in the locker room after one of those alumni games. He apparently, in their system, had put down that I was a photographer, and then when Dan, their current development director, got hired, he saw that I was noted in the system and asked if I wanted to be a part of their project in DR Congo. So it's one of those that you never know where in life things are gonna happen. Um, that being said, we had an absolute blast and were able to create a lot of good content that has turned into more work for them. So they are actually in the process of driving a brand new Land Cruiser Defender, or uh, Series 79, which is basically a Land Rover Defender, from Uganda into the Congo that they were able to purchase with uh, content we created. And they funded that in about six and a half months versus what a different org had tried to do that took them four years to get the same amount of funding. And that was like fifty six to $60,000. Um, they also do a lot of stuff with education. Here we are flying a drone over a school, and what we should have thought of ahead of time, but we didn't, was the minute that we put the drone in the air, all of the elementary school and all of the high school emptied out because they wanted to see the drone. Um, and so we didn't actually get the shot we wanted that time, but it worked, we got it eventually. Um, and seeing kids' reactions when they were able to see the screen is another one of those priceless moments because these are kids who see a plane come in that lands on the grass runway at the hospital maybe once every two months. Never mind seeing what the view is like because they've never actually been in the plane. So the fact that they were able to see above the sky essentially uh, was a really cool to just to see kind of their response and then also know that what we were doing was helping their futures. Uh, in a very stark contrast to Burkina, they can't drill wells for clean water in DR Congo. Because of the remoteness and the terrain, they can't get the equipment in to actually drill a well. But one of the nice things about being essentially a rainforest is DR Congo has a lot of freshwater springs. And they have figured out a way to essentially cap freshwater springs to protect it to what they ballpark estimate, like 90% cleaner than an uncapped spring. Um, and so this little video is one we made for them to use for trying to fundraise for more freshwater springs. And so far they've got funding for, I think, 22 to 25. They had to stop fundraising for it for a little bit because they couldn't actually do the work until they had the new truck. So now that they have the new truck, they'll be able to actually do some of this and then start fundraising more again.
Um, to give you guys, again, even a little more information beyond that, this is a pygmy village that we went to that was near the hospital. And our truck right there is the only truck that they will see for four to six months. Can you guys imagine not seeing another car for four to six months? Um, but these people, I mean, I, I find that most of the people I meet when I'm overseas are happier than the average American, um, exponentially. Um, and it's weird to say. Um, but at the same time with this, I had been continuously growing a business here and needs changed. And there was actually a while where I had an office here in Utica. Um, and I was serving a lot of stuff. And again, business growth, business change. At the time, I thought I had the way that I had to do it was that I needed to grow a production company here that could kind of keep moving while I'm traveling. And then I could go do what I want and then come back, but still have the machine moving. Uh, and so I started the plans for this and was serving my clients here locally. That's my wonderful dog, Chips. Um, and so, but still having the same mindset of you do whatever it takes to pull off a job, um, which I prefer working with nonprofits. And so locally, a lot of my clients have been nonprofits. Um, how many people here have heard of the root farm in Sequoia? So all of their marketing materials was actually done by me and a small team of people. Um, that is me in the blue coat up there. Again, doing whatever it takes to get the job done. Um, the root farm came to me and said, hey, we need to overhaul all of our marketing and we need to grow a lot of this new programming that we're starting. And so basically my team scrapped everything they had, started fresh. And similarly to what I do with a lot of my overseas clients is I'm trying to figure out what they're trying to do for about three or four years um, and really kind of help them push into their goals. And so we created this massive package, new website, tons of content that they ended up using and we launched it at the absolute worst time. And that's what made me realize that like there's no bad time if you have great content. Um, we launched their new website and everything like three days before Christmas of 2017. The video that we used for the launch, which I'm gonna show you guys in a second, had over 100,000 views in five days around Christmas. Mind you, this had nothing to do with Christmas. So that really kind of was a solidifier to me that I was on the right track with what I was doing, but it also at the same time made me wanna go overseas more. Um, so here's that video. The name of the root farm comes from our founder, Alice Root, uh, but really has so many more meanings. Uh, when you think about roots, roots are the foundation from which things grow. And the root farm is creating transformative opportunities from which people can grow and expand to become the best that they can be. The root farm's changed my life in multiple ways. When I interact with people now, I'm sitting up straight and I'm looking them more in the eye. It just makes such a phenomenal difference in her ability to just participate in regular life. She just gets better and better every week that we come. We see these kind of breakthroughs all the time with all the kids and adults we work with. Now, this is the reason I'm here, is to do this. The people up here are very friendly. They treat you like they're your family walking through the door. They're great people. The staff here is really good at figuring out how to motivate the children, how to keep them engaged. I felt like part of the root farm from the very first day. I was hooked from the very start. I love working up here. It's really exciting. It doesn't feel like work. I enjoy being here. You can achieve anything at the root farm.
form. With the content that we created for them, they ended up exploding some of their programming. The, the adventure course that they started, they decided to want, open it up for spring break uh, last year, 2018. First time they'd done this like open to public thing, they thought they were gonna make a couple hundred bucks for the week. They made more money in three hours on the first day than they thought they were gonna make for the whole week. And so that's able, for, it's one of those things that they're trying to create sustainability through this adventure course that could offset some of the costs that they have with having, I think they've got like 12 or 14 horses um, that they have to feed and that stuff. And they're a small nonprofit, so they're running on very tight margins. So having that type of programming start to explode has been great for them. Going into a little bit more of the, you never know where things are going to come from. I, shortly after wrapping most of this project, it wasn't quite launched, but it was pretty much there. My best friend calls me. Mind you, my best friend lives in Dakar, uh, or has been living in Dakar. He's actually about to move. Um, and to give you guys an idea of how long we've been best friends, this was from 2005. Not much has changed, I don't think. <laughs> um, but anyway, so he's been working in Dakar as a bookkeeper and been working in a remote village on the side, just building relationship. And he and his wife were trying to work with some leaders in this community to try and start a library media center. In Senegal, Education is one of their most important things, and the government actually basically makes it free. A lot of African countries, you have to pay to attend school. Not like the US where it's mandatory. In Senegal, it's free for ed to go to school up through high school. But when you graduate high school, you still have never touched a computer in many of the villages. Unless you live in the capital or a major city, you've still never touched a computer. So if a kid goes from graduating high school in a village that wants to then go to college, they're expected to know how to use a computer in university. So we went out and we went to a school and created a bunch of content around a program that they are starting to start a library media center. Um, they wanted to build a brand new building that they could get computers in and teach kids how to use computers. That is one of the largest things I've ever dealt with that's still in the works. Um, they have been doing it, but things have been a little crazy over there in the organization that they work with. So I don't know the exact status of it, but the impact that we were able to see just from having these conversations can be uh, amazing. And so they were using this type of content to show what change can happen. Um, and it, I actually found it super interesting how similar a lot of things are across African countries because you see very similar situations. It's just slightly different nuanced culture. Um, the food is usually amazing. Um, that being said, I did, <laughs> here, good sidebar story. In, uh, when we were out in Joine in Senegal, the, it was harvest time, so all the women were out in the field harvesting food. Men do not know how to cook over there. Um, so came to lunchtime, and they were like, oh, wait, we have to feed you guys, but we don't have food because the women are out in the fields. So we ended up getting this, like, half-fermented yogurt that had, like, millet or, like, oats in the bottom. One of the absolute worst things I have ever had. <laughs> I've eaten a lot of weird foods when I've traveled. That was one of the absolute worst. Um, yeah, so it's not always glamorous. Uh, and then this goes back into me coming back to my home in Burkina Faso in 2018. Um, I was there in November, so just a few months ago, and we were out in a bunch of remote villages near where I had already spent a bunch of time um, doing more clean water and irrigation type work. Uh, this gives you an idea of the impact that an irrigation system can have in the community. Um, this right here is a solar irrigation system in a part of the capital, which is name is Ouagadougou. I dare anyone to try and say that 10 times fast after. 
Um, but this area of Wagadugu is where pretty much people that have disabilities and women who are widows or have been abandoned by their husbands live because they basically get shunned from general society. And a pastor in this area had started to work with them and again, create social enterprise. So a group of people put in the solar irrigation system, which actually takes what we had done in the other village to another level where there's actually drip irrigation in each of these rows. So literally all the people had to do was go and turn it on. Mind you, all of the work is done by handicapped people and widows. So they're able to do a lot more and they actually get paid for doing the work so they're able to actually live and then their families have actually started to accept them back because they're actually able to provide and show their families that they can be a part of society and actually contribute. Um, and so this has created an immense opportunity. They actually have chickens and some other uh, birds that lay eggs. And I forget what the name of the bird was, but they have this one bird that lays, a, it's a specialty bird that lays an egg that like the high-end expat hotel you like buys and it's like eight US dollars an egg. Like something is absurd like that. Uh, but they, they raise them and sell it and they're able to continue to give back to the community. Um, and they do, in this community, they do like grain give out, like, donate, like that kind of stuff. And a lot of it comes from what they're able to grow in this area. Um, and you can see how dry it is all around. And that's pretty much what most of the country is like. Um, the people are incredibly happy. Um, these are just some of my favorite photos from the country. Um, and sadly on this trip, we didn't get a really well overcrowded bus. Usually the buses have stuff stacked up to like here. Um, it's some of my favorite photos are people sleeping on top of the stuff on top of the bus because they didn't have the money to get into the bus. Um, yeah, definitely has made me question things. Um, that being said, a couple years ago, my dad being the civil engineer, quirky mind man, figured out a manual pump irrigation system that you can see, this is just the pump off a well, and then there's this pipe that leads to a basin in the ground that you'll see shortly a little bit more of. But instead of the over $20,000 that it costs for a solar system, he was able to build the system for $2,500 something that is much more sustainable to be able to scale, but also instead of having repairs be expensive that you had to import parts for, all of the parts were bought locally and so you were able to then repair it easily by sending a local plumber to go get the parts at the market. Um, going slightly out of order, because I mixed this one up, this is the same school that we installed the solar system at five years later, or four years later. Um, as you can see, it's green straight throughout. That little hand, hand dug well is in the same spot of frame. But instead of being dry and brown all out here, it is green everywhere. <coughs> it's slightly overgrown at the moment that this photo was taken because the students hadn't come back to school yet but you can see just from general growth how much more green it was. Uh, back on my irrigation, this system has the same concept, but the difference is you pump off of the, the well, and then on the tower, there's another pump that pumps water from a ground tank up to a high tank, and then gravity feeds out to spigots where they wanted the spigots. Um, and then they can attach hoses onto the spigots and then run water even further without having to actually carry the buckets back and forth and back and forth. Um, you hear a lot of the stories of women having to walk miles with buckets of water. We were trying to eliminate as much of that as we can. Um, and some of the, the community leaders had already gotten ahead of it and they were starting seedlings that they wanted to grow bigger before we got there 
So that way they had seed, like small plants ready to go, so that way they were able to get more water onto them as they had started to grow, so they could grow things faster because we were just at the beginning of the dry season. So that way they were able to have food ready to go when they hit peak dry season, when everything else really started to die out. Super interesting, forward thinking, and I was really impressed by the way that the leaders of the communities uh, took advantage of this by being prepared. <coughs> that being said, I am about to show you guys, you guys are the first group of people to see this video. I literally finished this video yesterday. Um, what we're gonna be using to try and fundraise to do these projects. Um, their goal is to do another 32 in the next couple of years, and they're hoping to be able to continue to expand this beyond it. Um, with that being said, here you guys go. Sitting in Sub-Saharan West Africa, Burkina Faso is a landlocked country with incredibly happy people, vibrant culture, and spicy food. Burkina typically has a nine month dry season, during which many water sources become unavailable. This leads to widespread food scarcity and malnourishment. Hand dug and drilled wells are the most common water sources found. Some areas have solar powered pumps on wells, and a few of these even have irrigation systems attached, which eases the workload of the people tending to the land. While solar is an amazing resource, it is also extremely expensive to install and tough to maintain without having parts easily accessible locally. In 2016, a manual pump irrigation system was installed as a proof of concept to see how a village would take advantage of this type of system. After quite a bit of work figuring out exactly how to put it all together, the system was a hit. This allowed the village to grow vegetables in their garden through the entire dry season. While this system requires more work than solar, it allows a village to move more water further distances from the well without having to carry it. The spigots allow hoses to be attached, which can move water upwards of 100 to 150 feet from the well on some installations. This not only allows a village to continue growing crops throughout the dry season, but it also lets them start their seeds for their harvest season crops. Manual irrigation systems are a very viable solution in Burkina Faso. At just $2,500 versus the $20,000 it costs for a solar system, the installation alone is a fraction of the cost. It is also entirely made up of locally sourced parts and can be easily repaired by a local plumber for under $50. US Currently there are 9 irrigation systems installed in villages outside Deidugu with plans for another 32 to be installed in the near future. For more information, visit EngageBurkina.com. What'd you guys think? Awesome. All right, so how do I do this? Well, over the years, initially I was self-funding all of this stuff or having private donors, that kind of thing. Um, starting in 2017, things kind of, kind of started to change. Um, one of my biggest things that I have always said over the years is get yourself out there and get in front of bigger communities. I always, I, I'm a big advocate of creatives going to trade shows, getting out in front of big industry, that kind of thing. Um, in 2017, I was at a trade show in New York where I happened to get talking to someone from Sony Cameras Pro Services Department and get talking about, he starts asking me what I do, that kind of thing. Next thing I know, he's like, I need you here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Introduced me to someone else who then they loaned me $8,000 worth of camera equipment for my project in Senegal, which then opened doors for me to have conversations with them where they have sent me camera equipment for every time I've gone overseas pretty much since, and have opened doors for meetings with them about some other potential things. Uh, also, I've got conversations with other gear manufacturers that are potentially starting to back what I'm doing. Um, and it's things that I realized they want to back because it's already being done. Um, and one of my friends said it best, people don't want to hear about an idea and back an idea, they want to back what you're already doing. Prove that you can do it and then they'll jump on for what you're doing next because 
if you've already done it, they know you can pull it off again. Um, and that's why I love trying to do things a little bit bigger every time. Um, I didn't start with a big project. Like E4 project was a five year thing of me leading up to it, where with E4 project, we did seven videos and I delivered 300 still images. Um, I'm delivering 250 still images and one video this weekend for Burkina, but I've got more stuff in the works with them. Um, but also don't, it also taught me not to get lackadaisical or be comfortable because you never know what's next. You never know what's out there. Um, and that's, that conversation with Sony has opened so many doors and really made me realize that instead of the business model I thought I had to have of I have to have a production company that I happen to do what I do overseas, I can fully focus on what I do overseas. Um, and you guys are actually the first people to see the, the inklings of a full rebrand where I am completely focusing my business on what I do overseas in two different capacities. One is serving as a freelancer for other production companies that they would hire me to go shoot their projects, but also for NGOs for doing these types of work for them overseas. Um, with that, I open it up to questions. And if you guys want to follow along on the journey, that's my social channels for you guys to give a follow. Um, yeah, I, I'm also the only Simon Eisenbach in the US, so it's pretty easy to find me. Pro might even be the only Simon Eisenbach in the world. Um, all right, so any questions? There's nothing that's too far out there. I've had some really random ones from kids before. Yeah. My goal is to help NGOs grow. So I want to see people be able to live sustainably in their home countries. The only thing that I would say that if someone should have to become a refugee is because of political things that are out of their control. I don't want people to have to leave where they are from because of things like food scarcity or water scarcity. I want them to be able to live a very fantastic life where they're from, with their family, with their community. So I want to help organizations create that sustainability in different communities around the world. It's a very weird but specific goal. Anything else? This is a very shy bunch. <laughs> awesome. Well, that I can possibly, if you gave me a couple of weeks, I could probably speak some Mandarin. Um, I can speak a little bit of French. One of the guys that we were working with said that I had about the equivalency of living there for four months, um, which means I could get basic gist across, but don't ask me anything specific or else I'm gonna need a translator. Um, that's pretty much what I know. Um, usually I have a translator in country that helps out, but when you get into some of the remote villages, like when we were in DR Congo, we had local guy translated by one guy translated by the hospital director to English. So we were doing multiple layers of translation to get it to something that we could understand. Um, a lot of the places I go, there's like 50 different tribal languages around or variations of tribal languages. So it's very tough because some people only speak one very specific tribal language. Yes? What's the worst experience you've had? What's your definition of worst? It's so I mean, I've had food. So I've had food poisoning while I was overseas. I've had malaria. Um, I've been in the smallest commercial plane that I've ever fathomed where I had to walk in on my knees and the only seat I could sit in was where they had pulled the seat in front of it. Um, I have had ear issues off of a poorly pressurized plane. Um, but it's one of those things that I absolutely love the experiences with it. So it, it's, that's all minor details for me. How, how did they get, um, like, do you carry the gas with you? For the plane? Well, no, I was thinking in the truck. If you're, the, if you're a truck that, you know, that works in another truck for six months, there's not a... They, the hospital gets shipments 
from the neighboring country, <coughs> but it's usually like they get they buy it by the 55 gallon drum. Mm -hmm. where you go, you fill up and yeah, well, we were we never left maybe a 10 kilometer perimeter around the hospital because the fastest we were able to drive was 30 miles an hour, and that was when we were in a village because the roads are that bad. Um, they just regraded the road from the provincial capital to the village of Nebo, and it took, that was a 30 kilometer distance. It used to take four and a half hours in the dry season to get there, and it cut it down to an hour and a half by regrading the road. Um, yeah. That was, that's probably the worst driving I've had as far as like that kind of road. I've also had, when I was in Burkina in January 2013, we were on washboard roads for eight hours straight. And has anyone ever actually driven on like a consistent washboard road? It is absolutely obnoxious. So we were basically like, my, my back was like broken after that one. That was actually also when I had food poisoning. <laughs> and malaria too? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> Food poisoning was January, malaria was March. <laughs> yes? That will be used in direct email, social media, and some other uh, direct, uh, direct to donor uh, presentations. And uh, they'll have it in WAGA, and then the headquarters for the org is out of Georgia, and so they'll be using it based out of Georgia. Um, but they'll use it. It's mostly in the U.S. Most of the orgs I work with are based in the U.S. that are doing work in developing countries. Where are you going to head next? Well, so I was supposed to go back to Burkina. I couldn't go because we can't. Where I was in November, I actually can't go back to right now um, because of some situations that are happening. Um, I was supposed to go to DR Congo. That got held up because of Ebola. Uh, 200 kilometers away is where there's still an active flare-up of Ebola. Um, they actually have the second worst Ebola crisis still going in African continent history, of recorded history, I should say. And then I've got Ethiopia, which is a orphan organization with 1,500 kids under the umbrella of different programming in three different cities that we're just waiting on funding. Uh, I've been talking with some companies about trying to get the funding together, but it just hasn't quite come together to what we need. It's going to take about 20 grand to pull off that job. Yeah. A little bit. A little bit in the works. <laughs> Anything else? You guys can feel free to ask me questions afterwards if you don't want to ask them in front of the whole group. Awesome. Thank you, guys. <laughs>